Recently, I posted on my Instagram some automotive images of a Jaguar XE-RS. Now, these images were not traditional automotive photography per se. They were made entirely or pretty much entirely inside of Blender. So I'm going to basically walk you through those files today. So yeah, let's jump right in. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about Blender, um, what it is and why I love it. So why use Blender in the first place? Well, it's free um, open source 3D modeling and animation software. And as I said, I absolutely love it. I think that anyone can benefit from downloading and learning Blender, um, whether you're you know, a filmmaker or a photographer or a designer. Uh, it's just such a fantastic tool to have in your toolkit. It's also not as difficult to learn as it first seems. There is a pretty big learning curve and it took me a good few months to get to grips with it. But once you understand the basics, I mean, it's a little bit like um, Photoshop. You, know, you don't need to know every single tool um, in the software to be able to use it and get some amazing results out of it. So I like to compose the shots in Blender and the reason why this is so effective for automotive photography or like automotive imagery, I guess you could you could say, is because it's it's so quick and easy to be able to test out different compositions and different shot types as well. So to get um, this shot, for example, which is like kind of a, a you know, high up, high, high angle shot. If I were to do that in real life, I'd probably need to use like either a jib or um, some kind of like grip scaffolding um, or like a cherry picker or, you know, may maybe a ladder. I might get away with that using a ladder. But in Blender, it's super easy to get that shot and to kind of fine tune it and try out different focal lengths and try out slightly different angles and slightly different variations to really get that perfect shot. It really just speeds up the process of finding those like kind of diamonds in the rough of like different shots and, and different angles that, that you can try out. Um, it's really cool for that. So let's talk about uh, pre-made car models versus like actually making the model yourself in Blender. Now I'm a big advocate for um, if it if it exists and it's out there on these various sites um, then I think that you should support the artists and purchase these pre-made models. One you're supporting a good cause which is the artists who have gone out of their way to make these 3D models and to actually allow people like ourselves to purchase them and use them in our own projects. But it's also something that's already been made. Now I can and do model occasionally myself, um, but these are for things that don't already exist. Like if I'm doing maybe like some sort of creature that doesn't exist yet that I'm uh, inventing or um, some kind of other concept that just doesn't exist. It's also good to purchase uh, pre-made models online as well because I mean just think about it from like a logistics perspective would you rather hire a 3d artist for like four or five days to model a car from scratch and pay them that day rate or would you rather them just go and pick up a 3d model for like less than a hundred bucks and you, you've got that then you, you're off to the races so yeah my personal opinion is that um, certainly with um, cars and things that sort of already exist on these sites and someone has already kind of done it I think it's absolutely fine and I actually encourage people to support these 3d artists who have kind of already done the hard work for you so let's move on to actually lighting your 3d model now in 3d world lighting um, how you compose your shots is pretty much exactly the same as it would be in the real world. In Blender you've got a selection of different lights um, to choose from um, to, to kind of best suit your needs. When I light things, whether that be in the real world or in the 3D CG world, I typically go for like this kind of off side lighting or back lighting or kind of a, a strong edge light. The reason being is that this just works really well from kind of a 
cinematic code and convention perspective, but also it just works really well in CG. I mean, everybody talks about that scene from the original Jurassic Park where you've got like the two Jeeps and the T-Rex comes through the fence and starts just creating havoc. Everybody says that that scene and that particular piece of CGI, that that holds up today. The truth is, is that like the CGI from 1992, it just doesn't hold up today. But the reason why that scene looks so good is because they're doing everything else to really help sell the CG. So it's raining, everything's kind of shiny, it's dark, it's low key, and this T-Rex is being edge lit. And this just looks so good in CG, and that hasn't changed even here today in 2024. So again, I like to go for this kind of edge lit offside lighting style um, to really kind of help sell that CG car. Something else that you'll also notice looking at these is that I also use uh, HDRIs. Now an HDRI is basically a 360 degree image of an environment. This can be of a real environment or a CG environment. This is a real uh, 360 degree image that I downloaded from Polyhaven. It's a great resource, again, if you're working to a budget. So an HDRI is basically a 360 degree image. Um, that is often taken at different exposures. So you basically have a high dynamic range image that is also 360 degrees. And the way that this works is that you basically um, wrap this around your CG object or uh, whatever it is that you've got in your scene. In this case, it's our car. This provides really accurate lighting and uh, reflections for our CG object. Having said that, it's always good to incorporate extra CG lights into your scene as well. Just a quick tip for any sort of CG scene is that low key lighting always seems to look so much better in CG. For example, this doesn't always mean kind of shooting um, sort of grubby, gritty night scenes and kind of restricting yourself to that. I have done that in the past. Um, I made a short film called The Night Driver that had a lot of visual effects in and it was very kind of gritty. It had a kind of neo-noir look to it. And of course there was um, a car, a hero car involved in that. Um, but you don't need to restrict yourself to just scenes like this. Um, for example, I've got this scene as well, but you see this and your brain kind of goes, oh, okay, that's, that's daylight. You know, but if you actually break down the luminance of the overall scene, it's still pretty low key. And so that's just a little trick to help kind of really sell your CG and when you're trying to achieve photorealism. So finally, in these particular images that you see in here, um, I sort of wanted to have it look like it was being photographed on a, I guess, kind of like a shallow puddle or something like that. So, you know, the car's not like sunk right into the water. It's like, it sort of looks like it's on the water, but you're getting the reflections and you're getting the reflections of the sky in that beautiful HDRI. And so this was just done using a free normal map um, that I found online. And I just like reduced the strength of that right the way down just to give like ever so subtle ripples to that kind of overall plane. Finally, I uh, just composited these um, further in Photoshop. Whether you're dealing with just a still image like this or whether you're dealing with like an actual animation um, in CG, it's never gonna look completely real and photo real straight out of the, the render engine. Like the naked raw render, um, it's never gonna look photo real. The real magic happens a lot of the time in the composite. And a composite can make or break a CG render. So here are some things that I do to my CG renders. So I always add a little bit of lens distortion. Um, this is just something you don't get in the CG world, sadly. You can sort of do things actually in the composite. There's there's a compositing feature in Blender um, that you can add things like chromatic aberration and lens distortion and bloom and, and stuff like that. I prefer to leave all that sort Sort of stuff to the composite um, because I can really just sort of dial it in there. I don't want to bake stuff like that into just my raw renders. 
Um, I want to kind of leave myself with as many options as possible um, until, you know, it, it's crunch time and I actually have to deliver those those shots. So as I mentioned, I also like to do a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration. And this is just, again, one of those things that you get from um, lenses. It's often like the cheaper the lens, um, the 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 more noticeable this is in the real world. So it's always funny when, you know, in the real world you're like battling against this this kind of stuff, this lens distortion, the chromatic aberration, just these like artifacts that, that make your image imperfect. We often try and fight that in the real world. In the CG world, however, we're sort of fighting to get that stuff to really kind of make it seem real. That's another thing that I like to add as well, as well as like just my basic kind of grading that I do for automotive photography. I've got loads of videos on kind of go into detail about how I edit my car photos. So I'll probably link those in the description below. So you can check those out if you wish. I basically do just kind of various curve adjustments and just to kind of sweeten it up a little bit. As I mentioned, to like further get that kind of real imperfect look. Um, I always like to add a little bit of grain over the top of the images. Um, so this is like digital film grain. So broadly speaking, you've got two types of grain. You've got your film grain and your digital grain or your digital noise. And this is often not very nice. It's like fixed pattern noise. Um, there's like different colors and color shifts that happen. Just blech, not nice. Film grain, however, is something that's really nice and as counterintuitive as it sounds, it can actually make your images look sharper and richer and, you know, it kind of, you know, not, not to get too pretentious, but it but it kind of gives the, the image a more sort of organic look. Um, and I really like the way that film grain looks. Speaking of film grain, I have a small online store for assets, presets and LUTs. And the store is made with small creators in mind. You can actually get 10% off um, if you use my discount code TAO10 at checkout. You'd be supporting the channel, so feel free to check that out. So that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I will probably do a more detailed video on various other things to do with cars and car animation in CG. This is just a nice little icebreaker into the kind of automotive CG world. If there's anything that you can take away from this video, then I would highly encourage you to download Blender and just give it a go. Give Blender Guru's donut tutorial a challenge as well. I've got my old donut render somewhere kicking around on like an old hard drive. Um, I sat through it all and um, it's pretty good. So I'll uh, also link that in the description as well.